we cannot be more efficient than AI and machines and software and robotics at various things. And so the danger is we look around and be like, oh, I guess all those truck drivers just weren't adaptable enough. Like, I guess that radiologist, like, didn't, like, you know, didn't stay nimble enough. <laughs> <You know? laughs> like, like um, and, and then at some point you have to be like, wait a minute. Like, is it really, like, on the individual <laughs> to somehow foresee that their job was going to get taken by a robot 20 years, you know, like, later? Um, from when they made decisions. So we have to come together very quickly as a society and say, look, it's not anyone's fault. Uh, we have to make it so that people are actually being served by this progress and, and say, if we are truly experiencing this incredible bounty, like, should we really have the lion's share of the benefits being collected in the hands of a shrinking few organizations and individuals while the rest of us get kicked to the curb? That's Andrew Yang. He's running for president of the United States as a Democrat in 2020. I'm your host, Patrick McGinnis, and this is FOMO Sapiens, part of the HBR Presents Network. My name is Patrick McGinnis, and I'm the guy who invented the term FOMO. That's short for fear of missing out. Today, FOMO is an epidemic, and it's changing us so much that it sort of feels like we're evolving into a new species. But FOMO doesn't have to take over your life. You can find the power to choose what you actually want and the courage to miss out on the rest. I'll show you how right here on FOMO Sapiens. FOMO. 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 Hello, FOMO Sapiens. Before we get started with today's episode, I'm excited to share some big news with you. Starting today, FOMO Sapiens has teamed up with other business podcasters to join HBR Presents, a new network from Harvard Business Review. I'm particularly excited about this partnership because FOMO was born at Harvard Business School and now it's finally coming home. So I want to welcome all of the new listeners from the HBR community and I want to truly thank all of my listeners from before for making this partnership possible. You can find more business podcasts from HBR Presents by searching for HBR in your favorite podcast app or by visiting hbr.org slash podcasts for a full lineup. Now, on with today's show. FOMO. Welcome to FOMO Sapiens, the show where I interview people who are changing the world and ask them how they choose from among the many opportunities and options in their busy lives. I want to start today's show with a sobering take on what's happening in the American workforce. If you haven't heard, the robots are coming and they are coming for our jobs. If you think about it, in the not very distant future, automation will have replaced millions of jobs in the retail and services sectors, among others. And eventually, automation will hit white-collar workers as well. It is a brave new world, and we are not prepared for the implications of these irreversible trends. And surprisingly, it feels as if really nobody's talking about this. Well, if you start to hear a lot more about automation in the coming months, you will likely have today's guest to thank. Andrew Yang is an entrepreneur and author who is running for president of the United States of America as a Democrat in 2020, he is the founder of Venture for America, a national entrepreneurship fellowship that has helped to create almost 3,000 jobs all over the country. And in his book, and I love this title, The War on Normal People, Andrew explains the mounting crisis of automation of the labor market and makes the case for what he calls the freedom dividend, a universal basic income of $1,000 a month for every American. He is a graduate of Brown University and Columbia Law School and lives in New York City with his wife and two sons. And full disclosure, I'm an independent politically. I am not endorsing any candidate at this point. I probably will never endorse a candidate publicly. Um, but I felt that this message was so important that I wanted to have Andrew on the show to discuss his platform and his vision for the future. Welcome, Andrew Yang, to FOMO Sapiens. Oh, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so I like to start every show with the same question. Um, everybody feels a little FOMO sometimes. So what turns you into a FOMO sapiens? Well, I'm running for president. Uh, and so when there's some occasion where all of the other candidates show up and I'm not there, <laughs> then I think like, I'm like, was I supposed to be there? They're like, oh, no. Like, it's, this uh, makes me feel like I dropped the ball. So that's what turns me into FOMO sapiens is when there's a critical mass of other presidential candidates in a place, and I am not there. All right. Well, that is under. I mean, I can't understand that because I haven't run for president, but I get the concept. Um, so you, you mentioned you're running for president, and I, it, this is something that is kind of amazing because I get FOMO 
you know, reasonably often. And I've been tracking you for a while and watching as you've been telling the story. And I've been tracking you actually since you started Venture for America, which we'll talk about in a minute. And in the early days of that, I actually went to one of your annual galas. And I found it really inspiring that you were bringing all these high capacity young people to communities that maybe, you know, they wouldn't have gone to before to work in innovative enterprises to create jobs, to really change the face of the America that maybe, you know, that isn't the New York, San Francisco that, that gets all the attention. Uh, I don't have FOMO about running for president because it sounds very tiring, but I want to dig into this. And what, what got you into this idea of running for president? Take me through your trajectory. What happened with Venture for America and why you decided this is the right time for you to run? Well, I certainly never thought I would be running. Uh, I'm not some strange individual who grew up <laughs> thinking that they were going to run for president. No offense to listening to this being like, I've thought it my whole life. If you've thought it your whole life, you should probably do it. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, but I, I never thought I would. Um, I started Venture for America in 2011 in the wake of the financial crisis because I felt like there were so many smart kids heading to McKinsey and uh, Goldman Sachs and Silicon Valley firms uh, and not enough were heading to places like Detroit or Cleveland or St. Louis or Baltimore or Birmingham. So I started Venture for America with, with the idea that if we had more talent heading to these places to help grow businesses, that would be immensely generative and positive for both the country and the individuals. I thought that if you were to uh, become a business builder in a place like Baltimore, it just turns you into like a different sort of person than if you become a an Excel jock in like the, the bowels of a bank, um, which, you know, frankly, I mean, I have tons of friends in, in all these professional services fields. And so I started Venture for America. It grows six, very successfully thanks to a lot of incredible people and a lot of efforts, um, including some mutual friends of ours. And I had never spent that much time in Michigan or Missouri or Northeast Ohio or Alabama or on and on. And I was blown away by the divergence between many of those regions and Manhattan, where you and I are sitting right now, or Silicon Valley, where I've partially lived for the last number of years. Uh, and so uh, I, I've had trouble communicating that. I was like, wow, like it feels like you're in different dimensions or decades, not just a couple time zones away. And it gets even more extreme if you drive out of those metro areas, uh, you know, like an hour and a half outside of Pittsburgh and Western Pennsylvania. And you're like, whoa, like <laughs> this is like another level beyond anything I'd experienced. And then Donald Trump wins the election in 2016. And, you know, I've spent six and a half years now working in the Midwest and the South. And you have an inkling why he won, which is that we automated away four million manufacturing jobs in those areas. Uh, and so I'm running for president to make the case to the American people. It's not immigrants that are causing economic distress. It's that our economy is evolving in ways that's marginalizing human labor more and more, uh, primarily due to advancing technology. Yeah, it, you know, and I've seen this in my own life. I come from a small town in Maine. My grandparents worked in shoe factories and leather factories. Those went to the south, then they moved out to, I guess, Asia or other parts of the world. Uh, my um, all of the, my my parents' generation worked for you know, companies that did sort of manufacturing of electronic components. Those are all gone as well, and so I've seen in my own community the fact that you now have a lot of unemployment. You also have opioid addiction, which is, comes along with this as sort of a, I would you know I would displacement. Yeah, 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 exactly. Completely. And so you you know you you've identified this, and I think anybody who, as you've said, has gone outside of major cities and you know visited America sees what's happening, and you've come up with an innovative solution. Uh, which is the Freedom Dividend. Yeah, which is not actually an innovative solution. <laughs> well, <laughs> in the sense that it's been with us for a long time. Innovative in the fact that most people either haven't heard about it or immediately dismiss it because they think that it engenders some sort of thing that's contrary to our capitalist culture, right? Yeah, so, uh, so the Freedom Dividend is my rebranding of universal basic income. And the reason I joked about it being with us for a while is that Thomas Paine was for this at the founding of the country. He called it the Citizens' Dividend. Martin Luther King champion in the 60s called it the guaranteed minimum income. Milton Friedman and a thousand economists were for it in the 60s and 70s, called it a negative income tax. It passed the House of Representatives in D.C. under Richard Nixon twice in 1971. Well, you know it's got to be good if plan. Nixon came up with it. Uh, yeah, I mean, because he, he was influenced by Friedman and the gang. Yeah. Uh, and then 11 years later, one state actually 
passed a dividend where everyone in Alaska now gets between one and two thousand dollars a month. So it's not my idea. This plan isn't even my plan. Uh, where a guy named Andy Stern came up with a thousand dollars a month for every adult, uh, but the Roosevelt Institute studied the plan, said it would create more than two million jobs, grow the consumer economy by eight to ten percent, uh, and that's now the plan I'm running on. Wow. And so you have been out there evangelizing for this idea. And I imagine, you know, I've actually, so last year, I I believe it was late last year, Chris Hughes from Facebook came out with a book about universal basic income. Yeah. And I saw him speak a couple of times about that. So, you know, I I think it's, we're starting to see, you've really been leaning into the conversation. He's been out there talking. I don't know if you guys talk to each other. Sure. But this is something that uh, on the face of it, a lot of people push back against. And they say, well, you're going to encourage people to be lazy or you're going to encourage people to just sort of like, you know, sit around their house and, 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 and watch TV all day and stuff like that. But in fact, the numbers show that it would create employment. Um, this is not controversial. But as you talk about this around the country, I can imagine there are a lot of people saying, well, you know, I wouldn't, you know, I, I don't think that's fair that my neighbor should just get a sort of a salary for doing nothing. How do you answer that sort of criticism? Well, what I say is that uh, it's a a dividend to every citizen as an owner and shareholder of this great society where, you know, shareholders of corporations declare a dividend all the time. And this is a dividend for the American people. So your neighbor is a citizen, just like you are. You'll get it. They'll get it. And if you're working, you'll keep all of that. And if they're not working, uh, they won't. And and. As you said, the numbers bear out the fact that people will work at the same levels with this sort of income support in many ways at higher levels because they'll have more meaningful resources to be able to make moves and and start new businesses and participate in the market economy. Right. And I guess the average American, I've heard these stats and you probably know them better than me, but the average American sort of has no safety net. People are living paycheck to paycheck. Yep. So you are... In one sense, you're protecting the person who something bad happens, and rather than them have to go into credit card debt or something like that, they have the resources to sort of be able to cut that stress out of their lives or maybe, you know, avoid committing a crime or something to cover their basic needs. But on the other side, you're giving them the flexibility to say, okay, let's find, I actually want to do something. I want to launch a business. I want to build something. And I have a little bit of predictability with my income to be able to actually do that. Yeah, completely. Or the stats are horrifying, where 78% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck, 57% report they couldn't afford an unexpected $500 bill. And so if you get the sense that a mindset of scarcity has swept our country, it has. Because if you can't pay your bills, it actually decreases your functional IQ by 13 points or one standard deviation. And so if, if you're just stressed out all the time about, you know, if I pay this bill, I can't pay that bill. And if I take extra time, maybe I can save 10 bucks. Um, then it short circuits your ability to to be uh, future oriented and optimistic and problem solving. So, uh, if you put a thousand dollars a month into people's hands, there's obviously the concrete benefits where people would eat better and um, you know, like graduation rates go up and mental health improves and happiness improves, uh, which are no small things. I mean, those are big deals. Um, but the other thing is that you'd actually increase people's problem-solving abilities because then if you get the boot off their throats, uh, they'll actually think more clearly. Right. I imagine you, when you're constantly in financial distress, you're almost like in this fight-or-flight cortisol shooting off everywhere. It's hard to make thoughtful decisions when you're simply trying to survive. Yeah. J.P. Morgan did an inventory of all of their customers, which is like everyone because that's like Chase, you know, like all the Chase banking customers. And they found that the average American has massive income volatility from month to month wow. uh, of 30 to 40 percent. Uh, and that in order for them to stop experiencing this monthly volatility, their income level needs to essentially approach six figures, which is out of reach for the vast majority of Americans. So uh, imagine you know, having your income uh, go up and down based upon whether you got shifts or whether you, know, you get a gig and then... Uh, and then just constantly be staying one step ahead of your bills. That's the state most Americans find themselves in today. So I want to go back to the root causes a little bit. I talk about this in the intro, but this automation, um, you know, everything from self-driving cars to you know, the Amazon, I guess it's called the Go store. It's the store where you walk in, there's no cashiers. When you have cashiers and truck drivers, I think are the number one and number two jobs in America, employing you know, many millions of people. Yeah, retail uh, retail is something like nine million uh, and truck driving is three and a half million directly, but another five million in truck stops, motels, and diners that serve truckers. 
we can see all of those. I mean, without a ton of creativity, we can see all of those jobs being gone within what five to ten years. Yeah, those are the best ex- estimates. Where robot trucks are being tested right now in the Midwest, but five to ten years, you'll see meaningful adoption. And so, as, as we think beyond just those two industries, that I think are the low hanging fruit in terms of the analysis, as you look forward, like, w- and the, I think for our listeners you know, who may think, well, I'm a, you know I'm a white collar worker, I work in an investment bank or a law firm, or I'm a you know in, in a corporate setting. How deep will this go into our society and how much will it affect, you know, in terms of just the numbers, how much will it affect workers? So uh, I went to fancy schools. I went to Exeter and Brown and Columbia Law School and I live in you know Manhattan and Silicon Valley. I've got a lot of 40 something year old friends with elite backgrounds who are on the bench right now. And because they're not poor. They're just sort of like man about town or woman about town where it's like it's cool, like no one's starving to death. Uh, But Already, they've gotten churned out of their organizations because it turns out that that bank uh, doesn't need like a forty-something-year-old, very expensive. <laughs> like, you probably have have friends who are in, in similar positions. We don't talk about it that much. Oh, definitely. Everybody's in fun employment or freelancing. It's very common. It's very common, uh, and so we can put put a happy face on it because we're we're not at you know starvation's door or anything. But if you dig through what's going on, I spoke to 70 CEOs, mainly of financial firms, uh, and I asked them, how many of you are looking at replacing large numbers of workers with AI in the next number of months? Every single hand went up. You know, there, there's this massive bloodletting going on within certainly large companies um, where they're finding they can do more with fewer people. And if you think about the tasks that can be most readily automated away, a lot of them are the repetitive cognitive tasks that highly paid, highly paid professionals do, like yeah. producing, producing investment analyst reports. I was a corporate attorney for five months, and I joke all the time that a lot of that job can be automated, and it is being automated. I mean, they already have AI that can outperform experienced lawyers in contract review in terms of both accuracy and time and cost. So uh, the, this is not just a truck driver a uh, retail worker, call center worker, fast food worker, manufacturing worker phenomenon, though it is all of those things, and those five jobs are the most common jobs in the U.S. economy and comprise about half of all American jobs. But it's also a lawyer, accountant, insurance broker, radiologist, pharmacist. Like a lot of the jobs that white-collar educated professionals occupy can be automated uh, and then what you're seeing, uh, what you're going to see is like this flight for regulatory protection because people will be like, oh, you need to be a human to, you know, dispense drugs. You need to be a human to, <laughs> to look at the radiology film. And then uh, you're going to scratch your head and be like, you do? <laughs> you know, and, and that's, that's where it's heading. Yeah, I, I think if, you're, if, if anybody has any doubts, the, let's take the self-driving car for an example. If you think that it would be impossible to offer sort of uh, to, to outsource to AI something like going through legal documents in a discovery process in a trial or something like that. Think about the fact that in five to 10 years, cars will drive themselves. Like that's a much harder, bigger, harder, not, more dangerous, like nut to crack. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, we, it sounds audacious, but it's, this is happening around us. And even though you may not see it in your community, it's coming. So, so it, it doesn't sound controversial to me. Um, and at the same time, I think we all have to accept this, even though it, you know, it's an uncomfortable truth it is, you know, it's the reality of where we are. And because of all of this technology and the wealth that it's creating, we have to ask ourselves, you know, what kind of society we want to live in? Yes. How do we want to share the benefits of these gains that we're making in terms of productivity? I guess that's really where things come back to with you. Yeah, that, that, that's exactly right. Where we are trained uh, to be highly efficient members of this like meritocratic capital efficiency uh, engine, if you will. Um, and the danger is that we take that too long and too far where we cannot be more efficient than AI and machines and software and robotics at various things. And so the danger is we look around and be like, oh, I guess all those truck drivers just weren't adaptable enough. Like, I guess that radiologist, like, didn't, like, you know, didn't stay nimble enough. <laughs> <You know? laughs> like, um, and, and then at some point you have to be like, wait a minute, like, is it really like on the individual <laughs> to somehow foresee that their job was going to get taken by a robot 20 years, you know, like later um, from when they made decisions. So we have to come together very quickly as a society and say, look, it's not anyone's fault. 
Uh, we have to make it so that people are actually being served by this progress. And it's not that we are rioting truckers and rioting insurance brokers. I'm sure the insurance brokers wouldn't riot. <laughs> so, uh, and, and say, if we are truly experiencing this incredible bounty, like, should we really have the lion's share of the benefits being collected in the hands of a shrinking few organizations and individuals while the rest of us get kicked to the curb? Like, is that optimal for our society? I'm going to argue, you know, I'm friends with a lot of these technologists. Like, they don't think it's optimal, you know? Uh, like, enlightened self-interest. So if you look at the numbers, even the winners in a highly unequal society get sadder because uh, it's depressing being an elite in a, in a super unequal society. You get more suspicious, more distrustful. You have to hire bodyguards and, like, you know, get bulletproof cars and all that stuff. It's a drag. And so it's a loser for everyone if we just let the market dictate where everything uh, falls. Um, and over time, it's going to be very bad for the market if our society continues to disintegrate. And one of the reasons I'm running for president is if you look at the numbers, we are disintegrating. Where life expectancy has declined for the last three years, first time in a century that's happened. Last time that happened was the Spanish flu of 1918. Suicides and drug overdoses have overtaken vehicle deaths for the first time. Eight Americans dying of drugs every hour. Mental health crises across uh, whole demographics. But GDP, record high. Stock market, record high last year. And so if your measurements, and everyone listening to this, think about this, like, we're, we're corporate types. Uh, we're CEOs, and you know you make what you measure. If you're measuring the wrong things, then you just end up leading your organization off a cliff. So if we're measuring GDP and stock market growth and capital efficiency, we're going to head off a cliff uh, as a society. Yeah, you need the balanced scorecard. Yes, you need the American scorecard, which is uh, one of the... Is that something you're doing? Yeah, yeah, it is. Wow. Yeah, the next generation of GDP. After I'm president, I'm going to go to the Bureau of Labor and Statistics and say, hey, guys, GDP is almost 100 years old. It's time for an upgrade. And then you upgrade it to include things like uh, quality-adjusted life expectancy, childhood success rates, mental health and freedom from substance abuse, deaths of despair. Then you present that every year at the State of the Union and say, okay, how are we doing? Like, oh, well, eight Americans dying of drugs every hour. That's horrifying. Let's try and get that down by 50% over the next three years, and here's how we're going to do it. Um, so you actually have measurements that would matter to the American people instead of cheerleading this nonsense GDP number that has less and less relationship to anything. Yeah, you know, as, an, as an entrepreneur, as a board member in, in tech companies, and you, you've been in this world too, it's like you get the board pack and the KPIs, those key performance indicators. A management team that is confident and strong will choose the things that actually drive the business and will not be afraid to show the things that aren't working. Um, one that isn't will choose, cherry pick the ones that make everything look really great. Right. And so or also there's groupthink around just like we've done these things for the last, you know, this is what companies in our or, sector. Or maybe look my at. paycheck is tied to that too. Yeah. It's like, hey, I kinda like that indicator because I know I can yes. kick butt at it and I know I'm gonna get my bonus. Wait, so right now we have these indicators that we're good at and we're falling apart. Again, what good is a, a high GDP if people are dying younger, faster, more often? Uh, and so you know, you have to ask yourself, it's like, well, what's the purpose of the economy? And to me, the purpose of the economy is to serve us, human well-being. And if it's failing at that, then we need to reorient. So this plan, uh, if it were to be enacted, obviously has a cost. And I, you know, I'd love it if you just kind of take everybody through what the numbers look like. What is the scale of this investment? I would say, you know, there's an investment in, 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 in people. Yes. Uh, and what is what are the sort of, on the other side, you know, there's obviously going to be positive economic effects how does it all flow through and how does it get paid for? Sure. So some people on the face of it uh, just do some quick math and say, oh, uh, every adult getting $12,000 a year, that's about $3 trillion a year. Uh, our economy is $20 trillion, uh, up $5 trillion in the last 12 years, but still you know, $20 trillion, $3 trillion, uh, as a new expense seems very, very high. Um, for reference, the federal budget is $4 trillion. But it turns out that it's not $3 trillion. It shrinks very, very fast. And the reason it does is that we already have 126 welfare and income support programs uh, and Social Security that collectively transfer about $1.5 trillion into the hands of Americans every year. So Mitt Romney's famous 47%, the, the takers and all that stuff. 
Now it's about 50%. Um, and it is accurate that about half Americans are getting significant income support and various transfers from the government. So if you show up and say, hey, guys, freedom dividend, everyone gets $1,000 a month, but it's opt-in, and if you opt into it, then you forego benefits from other existing programs that are on this list. Then you end up bringing the price tag down very, very fast because anyone who's getting more than a thousand bucks already will be like pass. And if someone's getting seven hundred dollars in like food stamps and uh, he- heating oil and whatnot, um, and then they choose the thousand dollar dividend, that doesn't cost you a thousand; it costs you three hundred. So instead of this thing costing you three trillion dollars a year, the true cost is actually about one point eight. Um, okay. It shrinks fast. Now, the, the big move we have to make that helps pay for this is that who are the big winners from AI and uh, self-driving cars and trucks and new technologies? Uh, and it's Google, Amazon, Uber, Facebook, uh, Microsoft, like the biggest tech companies. And we all saw the headlines that Amazon paid zero in taxes last year despite record profits. Netflix paid zero taxes federally last year despite record profits. Not their fault. It's good management. I mean, you know, what are you going to do? Just give the government money? I mean, if you can figure out a way not to, then, uh, you know, like, uh, um, then that's good management. But uh, I would suggest that that's not ideal for the American public. And so for the American public, you got to look up and say, what's wrong with our system? Where the biggest winners of this are going to be paying very little into our coffers just as they're about to soak up a ton of work and value. So the big change we have to make is we have to join every other advanced economy in the world and have a value-added tax, which would then give the American public a sliver of every Amazon transaction and Google search and robot truck mile. And because our economy is so vast now at $20 trillion, a value-added tax at even half the European level would generate a bit more than $800 billion in new revenue. Uh, and so that's the big move I would make is have a VAT. Now, that still leaves you about a trillion short. Uh, and so the way you get that trillion, here's where the magic happens. If you're putting this much money into Americans' hands, what's going to happen? They're going to spend their local communities, the local uh, tutoring service and garage and uh, restaurant are all going to have to hire another person or two because all this economic activity is flowing through their communities. You end up uh, creating more than 2 million new jobs and you end up generating another approximately $400 billion in new tax revenue because of all this incredible activity. And you can imagine the catalyst entrepreneurship where you'd have tens of thousands of new businesses around the country. Then you save one to $200 billion on things like emergency room health care, incarceration. I was just with a prison guard in New Hampshire a couple months back, and he said we should pay people to stay out of jail uh, because when they're in jail, we just spend so much on them. Uh, and he's right. You know, it's like you, you think you're being smart by not spending money on people, and then you end up spending the money on them in much more costly, destructive, punitive ways. So we save one to two hundred billion on on uh, those institutions. And then the third thing that's the happiest is if you put this money into Americans' hands, what happens in real life? Health and nutrition go up, physical and mental health improve, worker productivity improves, stress levels go down domestic violence goes down, hospital visits go down. There's one study that showed if you were to alleviate poverty in the U.S., you would increase GDP by $700 billion just on the basis of better health and education outcomes. So we get back another $400 billion or so in just a stronger, more educated, healthier, more productive populace. And there was one stat that people listening to this will feel very strongly about where uh, the highest scoring students in the lowest income quartile, uh, quintile or less likely to graduate from college than the lowest scoring students in the top income quintile. What that means is that if you're in one of like the bottom 20% of families in the U.S. socioeconomically, even if you have the capacities as demonstrated by our test scores, you're not going to make it you know, most of the time. So imagine all the human potential you'd be unlocking by putting $12,000 a month in the hands of every adult, $24,000 a year into a household with had two adults in it, uh, and then what you'd see is you'd see educational outcomes improve for people that right now are, are trapped in, in various cycles of poverty. And, and these statistics that you're, that you're citing, what's sort of the period of time in which sort of everything would settle out? Is this like a three-year thing? Is this a 20-year thing? How do you, how do you think about that? Yeah. So uh, the economic growth would happen quite quickly because, you know, the money is going to get spent. Um, it would take some time to see cost savings in our institutions, and it would take some time to see uh, health and education uh, and output gain. So there's a bit of a lag uh, in terms of some of the benefits, um, but happily the economic returns would be pretty immediate. 
Well, if you're running for president, you have to make sure everything happens in three years so that when you run again, you can cite all your statistics. Oh, no, man. It's a painful thing. What I say is, like, I think it's ridiculous that we're judging presidents in real time. Like, you should be judging, like, you know, three presidents ago right now. Because, yeah. uh, like, it, you know, why did the financial crisis happen? Probably something we did 10 years ago. Absolutely. It's a very good, fair point that if you look at, at, at the economic policies, I mean, there are some things that will happen right away. And that's why there's an incentive to, for example, cut taxes quickly, get a big pop out of that. But can you sustain that benefit, you know, for, for, for a longer period of time? It's, it's, there's a lot of perverse incentives around these policies. Oh, my, my goal is to make the president 10 years after me look good. Like, you know, I mean, just knowing it's like... That's good. Look, I'm going to run 10 years after you. That's you perfect. should. You should. I'm going to make you look good. Whoever is going to be president after me, like, I'm going to create a bed of roses for you to just fall on <laughs> into. Um, so I'm curious... This, this, this is very interesting. I think a lot of people are thinking about this, and you've really raised the profile on this, uh, this topic. But at the same time, I ask myself, why president first? Why not run for, the, for example, mayor of New York City and institute these policies in a city like New York where you, you know, it's a big city. It's, what, 8, 10 million people. Show that it works here and then jump to the national stage. Why did you feel that it was you know, appropriate to first go to the level of the president? Well, a lot of it is I just don't think we have that much time. Like, if you're looking at a five to ten year time frame where you're starting to automate freight, I mean, uh, how are you going to get that done at a sort of societal level? Uh, and it's very hard for a municipality or state to implement something like this because of various balanced budget amendments and constraints. And if you were to become very generous, frankly, people would move to your locality just for whatever the heck you're doing. There's a reason why Alaska is the only state with a dividend because none of us are going to move to Alaska for a couple thousand dollars a year. But if Connecticut have a, had a dividend, you know, I, I think some people from uh, neighboring states would be like, you know what, I can move 10 miles for it. <laughs> so, uh, you know, there, there, there's a reason why this has to be a nation scale uh, response. And it is a nation scale phenomenon. We're in the third inning of the greatest economic and technological transformation in the history of the country. And the third inning has brought us Donald Trump. Think about that for a minute. So then, like, what, what, what are you really going to do about it? Like, what do the meaningful countermeasures actually look like? And as you think about running for president, I mean, imagine you've been out on the trail, you're bumping into people, you're building your, your profile. Obviously, it shows about FOMO. And one thing that you've been able to do is use social media whether it's you actually doing it or it seems like there's a lot just happening around you where you're hot on Reddit. You did the Joe Rogan show, which is another podcast out there, which um, if you haven't heard it, has I think it's one of the top podcasts in America. Yeah, yeah, top two or three. And I, it's a really good interview, and I'll, I'll endorse that if you want to. It's it's, it gets very deep into these topics. But you've been able to harness uh, in, in your own way the types of tools that wouldn't have existed 10 years ago. So if you had run for president 10 years ago, there were no podcasts, there was no Twitter, there were no memes, there was no Reddit. And, and, and it would have been much harder to break out in, in the way that you have, I would, I would argue. You can disagree with me. Uh, no, I agree with all that. Yeah, yeah, very much so. And so when you think about telling your story, and I think you've done this on very little money as well, right? How do you, um, how do you make sure, number one, that your message is true to what you're doing. How do you how do you think about social media and all these other new media elements in terms of building your community? Well, certainly a lot of it's necessity because, as you say, I mean, a lot of mainstream press was not uh, welcoming me with open arms because I haven't been a senator or a governor or any of that jazz. Uh, and so then, uh, you know, you have a message, um, you have. Uh, a need to find an audience. And so then you use the tools that are the most modern. Uh, and I'm happy to say that you end up uh, reaching people that have a real appetite for this sort of message that feel very ill served by, let's call it um, political cable channels or something like that. <laughs> you know, you know, it's not like, like there are a lot of people, I'm sure a lot of people listening to this resemble this. Cause if you listen to podcasts, you're now you're getting your information from po podcasts and you're not like tuning into uh, CNN every night to try and get your news. Uh, and so uh, I believe I am the beneficiary of many of the trends uh, of 2019. It's true. And let's talk about the money game, because uh, the, the Democratic primaries, I know in, to get into the debates, there are some new metrics. And one of them is you need to have 65,000 individual donors and then at least 200 donors in 20 states, I believe. That's one thing. Yeah, that, that's right. And uh, we, we've already met the 20 state threshold and we're at 47, 48,000 as we're having this conversation 
going up about two thousand a day. So we should be past sixty five thousand by the end of this month. And so you're you're going to be on that debate stage. And as you think about that, how do you, how are you being? Um, you know, the, the Democratic Party is a big tent, obviously, it, but it's, it's big this year, just a number of candidates. But also there's this whole kind of discussion around where the party's going and left, right and all that sort of stuff. When you get on a debate stage, unfortunately, it's not the best forum in the world because you get like two minutes. A pop. Yeah, that's true. I may have some zinger at the ready and I'll be like, I'm the opposite of Donald Trump is an Asian man who likes math. I mean, which is, you know, an applause line of mine. That, that, that would be, be like, good. we didn't ask you about that. And then it'd be like, it doesn't matter. I'm just going to say whatever the heck I'm <laughs> going to say during my six minutes of fame. <laughs> so is that, is, do you think that's, is that the play is to get on that debate stage and set yourself apart and really light the fire in your community? Or do you think it's just more about the slow and steady keeping and doing what you're doing or both? Well, certainly making the debate stage. Uh, and I'm, I'm, if I'm uh, in the debate in June, I'm also automatically in the debate in July. So I'll okay. have two bites of the apple. Um, but I, I certainly don't think it's going to be a make or break. The, the great opportunity, though, is that the vast majority of Americans have never heard of Andrew Yang. They're going to be tuning in for the first time. Most of them have no idea who's running for president in 2020. So they're going to turn on the TV and be like, huh, I haven't heard of that guy. And then it's like, oh, what did he just say? That seemed sort of interesting. And then they'll hopefully Google me and be like, wow. I do think that robots are going to be driving trucks like pretty soon and that we have no idea what the heck to do about that. <laughs> you know, that's like, so if, uh, so to me, it's a, it's a great opportunity to introduce myself to the American people, but I, I'm not going to go in there thinking if I don't say something historic, then, you know, like I'm just going to like be forgotten by everyone. And, and that is like a very nasty temptation of that sort of format. Oh yeah. I mean, you see it every time you've got this person who comes in with a can line. This is in all parties, by the way, they're ready. And then they get asked a question and they try to pivot and they come across, it just doesn't work. Like I, 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 I there are so many pitfalls because at the end of the day, you have millions of people watching you who are skeptical and then they pick up and start tweeting and you know how that goes. Then it just becomes like a, a war of attrition. Yeah. Some canned line or canned joke. And then even when the person says it, you can tell they're sort of half hearted about it. Cause they're like, Oh no. Like, it's such a bad feeling for us all. Like, you know, so I, that is not the plan. All right. Well, we're going to keep that you to that. Uh, Andrew, this is the show about finding the power to choose what you actually want in business and life and finding the courage to miss out on the rest. So people listening to you here, you've made a big decision. You left, you know, this enterprise you built to do something which is, I, you know, in a word, audacious, right? How, how you know, as people think about maybe doing something audacious in their own lives, how do they find the, 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 the courage to do that? You know, I, I've been very fortunate and, I, you know, I'm open about the fact that when I first started my first company, it flopped, you know, like crashed and burned. And then I worked for another entrepreneur and then with another business partner. And then, um, uh, you know, it's like eventually you build up a portfolio of um, resources and relationships where like it helps you be audacious, honestly. It's like, you know, so I certainly wouldn't be like, oh, everyone should, you know, let's drop everything and run for president. Um, I mean, the reason I'm doing what I'm doing now is, because I saw that there's this massive pressing need that if it wasn't addressed in a reasonable time frame, it's going to devastate our country, our society. I, I'm a parent. I've got two young children, and I have no desire to grow them up, to bring them up, to have them grow up uh, in the society I foresee us becoming. Um, and so if you think you have an opportunity to move that uh trend in the right direction uh and you say okay like if i drop everything and, and give it my all i think i can do something about that um then you have to do that and and so in terms of what i'm missing out on right now i have no idea what the, the, i'll tell you the one thing i'm missing out on is just time with my family yeah because i'm on the road all the time um and i miss them greatly and so when you talk about fomo like i i, I fear i'm missing out on watching my kids grow up yes well the good news is this is a this is a finite period of time. You run, and then if you're in the White House, then they will live with me. You're not gonna, yeah, the, the, you're not the, gonna you know, go walking around in the street, right? You're kind of stuck in the house. So, um, so you're right. I will be stuck in the house, and then that's cool. I'll be like Air Force One. Go. <laughs> <laughs> I need to have a state visit someplace now. Just kidding, remember me, bumped. you know, when you get there. All I really want to do is be ambassador to Argentina. Okay, that's that's all I'm asking for.
Wow, man. Like, I think you might have just called dibs on Argentina because I don't have another friend who's gone in on that one. Well, you know, I'll tell you something. Very few of the ambassadors have actually been to the countries that they're representing these days, which is quite atrocious. So I can promise you I've been there. I speak the language. So, you know. No, you now have the inside track, my friend. I'll take Uruguay as well. <laughs> you know, Uruguay is like a small paradise. Then that one's totally unclaimed. So, uh, yeah, now you have no choice but to help me get elected because if I get elected, then ambassador to Uruguay it is. Or right. Argentina. There we go. Well, you know, and th- this is a perfect transition because, you know, people have been listening to you for the last half an hour and they may want to get involved, help out, help you uh, to get into the debate or just learn more about what you're talking about. Um, so where can people find out more about you? Yeah, so if you go to yang2020.com, you'll see I have a platform of 75 policies. I'm not just about uh, the freedom dividend. I'm also about modernizing GDP, uh, putting a psychologist in the White House, uh, banning robocalls, uh, paying NCAA athletes, really just solving the obvious problems that we can see that that would make make our society someplace we're more excited about. But if you go to yang2020.com or you Google Andrew Yang, you can see what I'm about and would certainly love your help taking this case to the American people. Well, thank you very much. You know, Andrew, it is uh, not every day I get to spend time with a presidential candidate, but, um, but I've had a really good time today, and I wish you the best of luck. And thank you for your service. At the end of the day, you're doing this um, for the benefit of everybody, bringing these ideas into the, uh, the forum of public discussion. So I wish you the best of luck. Thank you so much. FOMO. And now it's time for the faux moment of the week, that part of the show where we talk about how FOMO is playing out in popular culture and the global conversation, or about things that are giving me FOMO. And today I'm going to talk about Holmes mania. Unless you have been living under a rock, you probably noticed that Elizabeth Holmes and Theranos are everywhere. This is a story about Silicon Valley FOMO gone amok, billions of dollars lost, and a lot of deception. And it's been uh, told in books like... Bad Blood by John Carreyrou and the podcast, The Dropout with Rebecca Jarvis, both of which have been huge hits. And I can't get enough of it. I got to tell you, I read the book Bad Blood in one sitting. I binged the podcast. And if you haven't checked them out, definitely do so and prepare yourself for more. There's going to be a movie on HBO. There's going to be a feature film with Jennifer Lawrence. It is going to be everywhere. FOMO. If you have a faux moment of the week or you have a question, reach out to me at let's connect at patrickmcginnis.com or via Twitter at PJ McGinnis. Send me your thoughts, your ideas, or your questions, and we'll talk about them on this segment of the show. You can also head over to my website to take the official FOMO quiz. Just go to patrickmcginnis.com slash FOMO dash quiz and find out if you're a FOMO sapiens. FOMO sapiens is part of the HBR Presents Network. The show is produced by AW360 and recorded in New York City. Theme music is by Mike McGinnis. If you like today's show, please be sure to subscribe, rate it, and recommend it to your friends. And as always, you can find me at patrickmcginnis.com. You can also take the official FOMO diagnostic at patrickmcginnis.com slash FOMO dash quiz to find out if you're a FOMO sapiens. <laughs>